I uh, read this in my own personal Bible reading a couple weeks ago, and um, this is uh, this is just uh, I don't even know if you call it a sermon. It's just a, a meditation that I just started writing, and and uh, we'll see where we go today. If you'll stand with me, we'll turn. We'll start reading verse number ten of Ephesians chapter number six. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for Scripture. Uh, there, there is so much here that not, there's no one human mind that can comprehend it all in a whole lifetime of studying. And so this dimension of, of the, the spiritual life, the Christian life that we are going to cover today, I pray that you'll open our minds and our hearts to have a, a greater understanding of, of you and your word and also of a greater awareness of the schemes of the devil. In Christ's name we pray, amen. You may be seated. So what we read, uh, if, you, if you are um, not familiar with the book of Ephesians, is in essence a, a summary statement. Uh, he, he takes everything that he taught in, in Ephesians and he collects it into this one summary statement at the very end this is what you're, you're to do. And Paul's letter to the church at uh, Ephesus is a, is a brilliantly written uh, letter. It explains how that, that Christ reconciles man to himself. And you, you begin in chapter number one, and you see the salutation, and it's, it's saturated with this rich language describing the glory and magnificence of the spiritual blessings that we have in Christ, who has not been blessed by chapter 1 of Ephesians? It's just a rich, rich chapter. Chapter number 2 uh, powerfully describes how God brings us from spiritual death to the kingdom of God by His glorious might. Why? Why does He do that? Next slide, please. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 7. This is why God does this. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness. How? In Jesus Christ. He does it to us in Jesus Christ. Think about the infinite nature of God. His infinitude in every characteristic that he has. Thank you so much, Bruce. The infinitude of God, and it says the immeasurable kindness of the grace is going to be expressed to us through all of eternity. But how does that chapter begin? And you were dead in trespasses and sins. And it goes on to describe us as children of wrath. And the, the language there means children destined to wrath. And then you have those two great words, but God. Isn't that wonderful to know? powerful words and he continues in chapter number two in chapter number three not only has christ united all people from all nations to himself but he has united us to one another in the church literally we gentiles have the same privilege as the jewish people before the throne of god we take that for granted today we we don't think much about it in, in Paul's day, that was a revolutionary thought. Not only that we are the same family, but we're closer than as if we were in the same body. We're the same body with one another. I, I want you to think about this. Grasp, grasp the magnitude of this teaching. The Bible over and over again teaches that our bond as fellow believers in Christ is closer and more permanent than the bond that we have to our own flesh and blood families. That's literally what the Bible teaches. Do you realize that? You are closer to your brother and sister in assembly 
than you are to your, to your mother and father, to your brother and sister. You, that's a closer bond. The, the, the only familial bond that is even as close as a church as, is the husband and wife. And do you know what the Bible calls the bond of the husband and wife? It's a copy. It's a copy of what? It's a copy of the bond of Christ and the church. So Christ and the church and all that is the primary. The marriage bond is the secondary, patterned after the primary. And so our marriage bond to our spouse is only temporary. But our marriage bond to Christ and our union with other believers is permanent. Long after you are separated in your marriage by death from your spouse, you are joined to them eternally as a family, as a brother and sister in Christ Jesus. That relationship is transformed. And there was an incident in Jesus' ministry that Matthew records that, that illustrates Jesus, Jesus taught this very thing. Think about this. Um, in Matthew chapter number 12, I'll just put it on the screen behind us. It says, while he was still speaking to the people, behold, his mother and his brother stood outside. Now stop there. Notice it doesn't say father. Because his father wasn't his flesh and blood. But his mother and his brothers, were they his flesh and blood? They were. Jesus was 100% human. And so therefore, you're talking about his actual flesh and blood. And it says his brothers and, and stood outside asking to speak to him, but he replied to the man who told him, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister. With this little statement, Jesus is telling us this is an actual real truth. He was fully human, but he understood that the bond that he has with you and I in the church is closer than his own flesh and blood at that time. And a lot of times we look at that and we read it and we see the Bible truth, but we don't really act upon it and we don't really believe it by the way that we, we, we um, think about things doing. Do you really believe that? It's kind of a hard one to, to, to think about, isn't it? Chapter 4 of Ephesians begins the application. In light of these great truths, uh, Christians are to lead lives that are a fitting tribute of gratitude to who the great Lord is. He, he explains this great salvation. He explains how we're unified together. And then he tells us to do what? To walk, the King James says, uh, circumspectly. He says this in Ephesians chapter 4. If you're in Ephesians, you can turn over there. Verse number 1. I, therefore, prisoner uh, for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness and patience and bearing with one another. And then, he says, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit. Eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit. That's, that's how we walk. Knowing all this truth about salvation we're to walk, we're to maintain these relationships. And then the rest of the letter, the rest of the letter describes that walk, that lifestyle. We are to walk in love. We're not to have angry words with one another, are we? We're, we are not, we are only to speak those words that build one another up. That's a tall order right there, just those two. And that's only like a couple verses out of four, cha three chapters. Where he, he goes on and he tells us that we're not to covet. We're, we're to love one another. We're to build each other up. And then he gets specific, doesn't he? He talks about how that looks in a marriage, husbands and wives. He talks about how that looks between children and their parents. And then he talks about what that looks like in the workplace situation. And so he's fleshing out this magnificent salvation. And then we get to our summary statement that we just read at the beginning of the, of the message. And when I read this passage a couple weeks ago, I was struck by the summary that Paul is giving. 
Listen to this. Please listen. Paul is saying that all of these relational issues, our use of our tongue, whether it's in gossip or cutting words or angry words, um, our, our obedience to our parents, our respect for our bosses, our control of our fleshly appetites, whether it's food or sex or wine or whatever it is, all of these things are what? What are they according to Ephesians chapter 6, 10 through 13? They're the schemes of the devil. They're the schemes of the devil. The schemes of the devil, don't miss this, they present as relational problems. Personality differences. That person just gets under my skin. Or that person slighted me. I can't even believe that they did what they did. And it presents as a relational issue, or, or it presents relationally, but these are the outward manifestations, the symptoms, listen, of an inward spiritual warfare that's going into all of us and is going on in our body. And we know this. Look at verse number 11, chapter 6, verse number 11. Paul uses an interesting word. The ESV translates it schemes. I memorize as a child in the KJV, and it uses the word wiles, right? The wiles of the devil. This word, that's the appropriate translation for the context of this. But the word schemes can mean methods, the methods of the devil or the procedures of the devil. <coughs> All of these things uh, are part of Satan's methods and Satan's procedures. They're not just, well, that guy just rubs me the wrong way. Uh, we just have a little bit of a personality difference. No, it's, it's much more than that. And so um, it's all these relational issues are just part of his schemes. They originate in the spiritual realm. Where do they originate according to chapter number 6? Principalities and powers and spiritual forces of evil and heavenly places. How is that for reframing your cutting word that you gave? How is that for reframing, or reframing that gossip? Or slander, whatever else it happens to be. A complete reframing of it, isn't it? Getting right down to the source. Now, we're finally getting into what I wanted to preach. And that is, the devil has methods. And they haven't changed. They're, they're the same methods since the beginning of time. His methods... His schemes, what are they designed for? They are designed for our harm. Satan hates God. He hates you, and he hates the church. Therefore, he is always scheming against God, and he's always trying to destroy the church. And so with that as kind of an introduction... What, I want to ask this question, what are his schemes? What are his methods? This is not exhaustive. I just want to go over three big ones. Three big ones um, and, um, and, and just look at them. What are the methods that Satan uses, A, to get you to sin, B, to try to destroy the glory of God, and C, how to destroy the church? How does he do it? The biggest one Far, bar none, this is the very biggest scheme of the devil. He uses our own appetites. Our own appetites, doesn't he? That's the most common scheme of the devil. That's what he used, by the way, in Genesis chapter number 3. The temptation of the fruit. And the, the other appetites that are involved there. Turn with me to Galatians 5.16. I want to show you this. And when you look at these verses we're about to read, I want you to notice how Paul sets walking by the Spirit against the deeds of the flesh. And I'm going to make a summary after we read this together. In, in Galatians 5.16, he says, 
But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Now, there you have it right there. You have two things. You have walking by the Spirit, so he, he immediately sticks it in the realm of the spiritual, right? Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. So that's, that's what's over against the Spirit. Let's keep reading. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. What are they? Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions. There's all those relational sins, right? Um, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and all the things like this, I warn you, and I warn you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And so there you have the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of God, or walking by the Spirit and deeds of the flesh. These are the fleshly appetites, if they are not kept under control, are, um, I think uh, somebody's microphone's still on somewhere. So, um, if you don't keep them under control, is this me? It is me, okay. All right. If you don't keep them under control, and I lost my train of thought, but anyway, it's a spiritual war. It's a spiritual battle. Um, I think microphones are a spiritual battle as well. <clears throat> oh, all these fleshly appetites and the accompanying temptations are used by Satan to cause us to sin. Is that true? You don't even have to read the Bible for that. You can see it all around you. But the Bible, you see it all through the Bible. These are the things that destroy. So it's fleshly appetites. What's another scheme of Satan? What's another method of the devil designed to stop? This, this method, by the way, the next thing I'm going to give you, is one that's designed to stop you by force or to stop you by fear. And that is government. Satan's favorite and most powerful tool this way is oppression from the government. We can go all the way back to the book of Exodus to see this, can't we? We, we see the oppression of Pharaoh Pharaoh is a type of Satan, um, he's in, in, he oppresses God's covenant people, Israel, and it hasn't changed. Satan, we, we see, that set the pattern for the, all the rest of Scripture. The New Testament is brimming with examples of this. Um, Paul and Silas were thrown into prison in Philippi, but instead of stopping the spread of the gospel, it furthered the gospel, Acts ends with this. Now, Paul is in prison in Rome at the end of the book of Acts, and it says, he lived there for two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the, teaching, the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and hindrance. And that's why he's in a house arrest in Rome, and they're trying to stop the gospel. Philippians, in Philippians, Paul writes about that, his imprisonment in Rome, and he says, you know what? My imprisonment advanced the gospel. He says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. And so Satan <coughs> wants to dominate the world, and he wants to use government to do it. Now, little detour here. In the past, governments have not had the ability to do that to the degree that they do now. And now... With the communication the way it is, Satan has the means to control the whole world through government. And that's what he's trying to do. Well, there's another scheme or, or method of Satan that I want to talk about. And that is uh, physical ailments, physical sickness, or, or whatever else. Satan also strikes physical sickness on God's people. We're all familiar with Job, aren't we? Job and his, his boils and his sickness. That was, we know from Job, Job chapters 1 and 2, 
And then the end of, of Job, we know that that was only the outer manifestation of a root cause. And what was the root cause? It was Satan. It was spiritual forces that struck him. During Jesus' earthly ministry, we get a glimpse, a small idea of the scope of, of how much sickness is inspired by spiritual realm. There, there was a, a mute man in Matthew chapter 9 who when Jesus casts out the demon, he can speak. There was a blind man and mute man in Matthew chapter number 12. Jesus cast out the demon and his blindness was healed and his muteness was taken away. In Luke chapter number 13, it says that there was a woman who was stooped over and disabled for 18 years because of a demon. And Christ cast it out. They have power over your physical health. Now catch, well, let's go one more thing. Then there's this curious verse. Turn with me to, to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and we're going to look at uh, verse number 7. Some of you are going to disagree with me, and that's completely okay. You can be wrong if you want. But um, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 7, so to keep me from being conceited. Now, what is he talking about? He, he just got a glimpse into heaven, and to keep him from de- being dis- conceited about that, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelation, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from be- becoming conceited. And, um, and so that's what that verse says. Now, there is, there is a lot of debate about the thorn. Y- y'all have heard the debate, right? One... I'm, I'm going to tell you my belief, and then I'm going to tell you all the people who are wrong. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, um, sort of. I believe that what Paul is dealing with here is actually a person who's causing this unity in the church. And I, I get that from two things. Number one, he says, thorn in the flesh. Now, aren't people flesh and blood? Okay? But later on, I think it's verse number 10, he he summarizes all this unity and everything going on in the church of Corinthians. If you read the context there, it seems that that thorn is disunity and, and somebody who is opposing Paul in the assembly. However, another very common belief is that Paul had some form of physical ailment. Right? And there's all sorts of speculation what that is. And I don't know what it would be if it were. But here's the bottom line. This is what I wanted to tell you. Even if it is a physical ailment, God allowed a messenger that is an angel, a demon, right? An angelic being, a, a evil angelic being to afflict Paul somehow, some way. Whether physical or whether through disunity in the church, but the, the origin is spiritual. You see? So catch what I am not saying. What I am not saying is that every ailment has a spiritual origin. I'm not saying that at all. And I'm, uh, some ailments can have spiritual realm as a root cause, but ailments are not always caused by that. But sometimes they are. And on this side of eternity, we will never know, will we? There are more methods of Satan. But you might ask, why am I highlighting these three methods, these three schemes? Appetites, government, and physical sickness. It is because our church is in the midst of spiritual warfare. The Bible makes that very clear. We're in the midst of spiritual warfare. And these are the symptoms of that spiritual warfare. Our nation and our churches are in upheaval right now. Are they not? Well, there, in 2020, there was a perfect storm. First, first element of it was coronavirus. What did government do as soon as it came out? 
lock the churches out. You can't assemble. Is that spiritual warfare? Is that not God's scheme, or I mean, I'm sorry, Satan's scheme against God, right? And so many churches stay closed for an extended period of time. It's incredible to think about. So, so a disease was used by government to stop the spread of the gospel and cripple the churches. By the way, they failed miserably. There's all kinds of testimony about how that did not work. Then add into the mix the strong opinions of people on either side of the whole vaccine and mask debate. And Satan gets right in there, uses things that we're very passionate about, and stirs it up. And all of a sudden, this brother that I was so close to who has a different opinion to me, I'm beginning to take a second look at him. Tell me, don't lie to me, because you've done the same thing, right? Haven't we? Nobody, nobody wants to admit that. <laughs> And all of a sudden, that bond to unity is, is not as strong as it was. Then, you add another thing, right? In, at the same time, what was the other thing that came up? Black Lives Matter protests. And everything involved in that. And that was one more element. Then all of a sudden, you find out, wait a minute, this person's totally different than me in this area of belief. And, and, and it affected both our nation and our churches. It affected this church. This church is different. And when I say different, I'm talking about who's here. Pre-coronavirus, post-coronavirus. It has changed. And so, as far as PBC is concerned, Providence Bible Church, I believe that our church is doing very well. I, 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 we have weathered hard times. There is a sweetness of fellowship around Jesus Christ. God is actively giving us new outlets for ministry. He's given us other possibilities, and, and, and things are moving right along. But to be honest with you, for the second time in three years, our own family is dealing with physical illness. And I am well aware, I am well aware of a strategy of Satan is to attack the shepherd. He wants to attack the shepherd. If he can get a shepherd to fall morally or, or get a shepherd to be filled with pride, become some sort of a, um, a king or whatever you want to say, set up his own kingdom, he can destroy or affect the whole church. You, you have seen and I have seen churches that have just been completely destroyed because the shepherd fell into immorality. But he also does it by trying to discourage shepherds. And, and one of the, the, the secondary effects of coronavirus is that there was a wave of pastors who got out of the ministry because the pressure, they were discouraged and the pressure was too intense for whatever, whatever they were doing. And so Satan wants to attack the shepherd as well. This is a spiritual warfare. And so... Here's a question I want to I want to ask. Given all this, are we to spend all of our time looking over our shoulder looking for a spiritual boogeyman? <laughs> no, we're not. I want to remind you of something. This is what we do instead. I remind you that all of life is theology. Your theology, dear believer, affects every part of your life. It, is, it affects how you spend your money, how you raise your kids, your view of retirement and recreation, your view of your job and your role in your job, and everything else. And so <clears throat> what I want us to do is look again at these same three devices of Satan but we're going to look at, through it at a, a theological lens. And the theological lens that we're going to look through is a term called providence. Providence. What is providence? Providence is that governing power of God that oversees his creation and works out his plans. You know what that means? 
I'm going to say it another way. You ready? Satan cannot win. Satan cannot win. He can throw everything at us, and it all falls under the providence of God. Do you remember the verse, Romans 8.28? I think I referred to it this week in an email. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to His purpose, all things are not good. But all things work together for good for those who are called. And so let's just work our way through this real quick. Joseph. Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. He went from slavery. He was, he was lied about as a slave and sent to prison over somebody else's lie, an evil person's lie, right? Remember that the devil is the father of lies, and this woman was doing the devil's deeds for her. But then he went to the, to the throne room of Egypt. After the death of his fa uh, father, his brothers who sold him into slavery were afraid. And this is what he told them. Here's providence. Ready? As for you, you meant it evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they were today. That is providence right there. You meant it for evil. Satan means it for evil, and God allows it, and he means it for our good and for his glory. That's providence right there, isn't it? Think about, let's go to the book of Exodus. Let's think about Pharaoh. Pharaoh is a type of Satan. He gave the order. This is government oppression, by the way. He gave the order to destroy Israelite boys. As a result of a chain of events that occurred in which Moses was raised in Pharaoh's own household, he was driven from Egypt and returned to Egypt after a period of time and was used by God to destroy Pharaoh and his household and his army. And this is what God told Pharaoh through the mouth of Moses. He said, but for this purpose I have raised you up to show you my power so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. Pharaoh was a wicked person. He did wicked things. He killed he killed at will. He enslaved people. He was a terrible, wicked person. But God said what? I raise you up because I'm going to show you my power through your evil deeds. That's providence. Think about Job. We can't, we can't talk about this sort of thing without mentioning Job and physical ailments, right? Satan was allowed to strike Job physically. But more than that, Satan was allowed to completely destroy his fortune. He was left penniless. And this is astounding to me. Not only did he, he destroy his fortune, God actually allowed Satan to kill Job's kids. That is stunning. And on the surface, you look at that and you say, how can a good God allow somebody to die like that? Isn't that a natural question? It is. But God meant it for good. And Job knew, knew his God. Listen to James' description. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job. You have seen the purpose of the Lord how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Now, the way this verse is structured, do you, know what, do you know what it seems to indicate Job was doing? Job was remembering all through his affliction that the death of his own children, at, at the loss of his fortune, and, and the physical sickness that he was um, experiencing, he is still remembering that God is compassionate and God is merciful. And we, when we are in the, the furnace of affliction, when, we're in the, when everything in life, it just seems, you, the natural interpretation is, God is angry at me. You must remember that God is compassionate and God is full of mercy, is he not? And when you do this, it sustains you and it gives you hope and honestly, it can also give you joy. The Bible tells us to be joyful, right? Let me give you one more example of the providence of God. Paul. Paul, the, um, the New Testament repeatedly 
uh, talks about God's providence and, and shows how he providentially uses the schemes of Satan to further the gospel and glorify God. Of course, the penultimate scheme of Satan that was foiled was the death of Jesus Christ, right? And, and we could say so much about that, but, uh, but I, I don't want to uh, go to that part. Let's go to Paul and Silas. They were thrown into prison in Philippi. They sang a song at midnight. They preached the gospel, and the whole jailer's family was saved. And this is what the Bible says. It says, Then he, talking about the jailer, brought them up into his house, set food before them, and he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. They were thrown into prison because of their preaching of the gospel. And in prison, they got to preach the gospel to the prisoners and then win the jailer and his family to the Lord. Earlier in Acts, the, the persecution of the church of Jerusalem became so intense that the church was scattered. Remember that? They were, the, the church was centered in Jerusalem. Now, they're probably thinking, man, this is a good thing. Get rid of all these Christians. But you know what Acts chapter uh, 8 says? Luke says this, those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Is that not God's providence overruling schemes of Satan? Finally, let's all turn back to one verse that we already covered. Go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 7. And I'm going to wrap up here very quickly. Go back to verse number 7. And, and we're going to begin reading there. It says, So to keep me from becoming conceited, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me, but he said to me, and this is where I want to go, this is so important for all of us, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. That's what God said to Paul. And so what did Paul say? Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly in my weakness, so that the power of God, or Christ, may rest in me, for the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And there it is right there. Paul, when he describes his minute, first and second Corinthians. If, if I could give you a theme, a, Paul's personal theme, it's Christ's strength, my weakness. Christ's strength, my weakness, all throughout that. And that's honestly the theme of my ministering here at Providence Bible Church. Christ is strong, I am not. So whatever is done, ministry-wise, is because of the magnificent, overwhelming power of God and not anything of my own. For when I am weak, I am strong. Let me wrap up. You must be aware of Satan's methods. He uses our own appetites of the flesh. By the way, these appetites are, are God-given, but Satan tempts us to pervert them. He uses government and cultural pressure to get us to compromise or to quit. He uses sickness to discourage us or to cause us to doubt God's goodness. But we don't spend our time looking over our shoulder, do we? We don't spend our time cowering in fear, do we? But rather, we spend our time, we spend our time looking to Christ, meditating on his goodness, and guarding our hearts against temptation. Amen? Amen. Lord, we thank you so much for Scripture. This, this, wasn't, this wasn't much today, Lord. But again, your power is made perfect in our weakness. Satan wants to sift us as wheat. He wants to destroy your church because he hates you and he hates Christ and he hates us. But Lord, in your providence, you will win.
I'm reminded of the words of Romans chapter 8, that nothing, nothing will separate us from the love of God. There is nothing that can be thrown against us that will separate us from your love. We just want to confess right now, we love you, Lord. Conform us more and more to the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.